Welcome back. You're watching Stockwatch with me, Julieta Televi, and joining me to take your questions this evening are Derek Janser from Rendsburg from Anchor and uh, Devin Schutz from the Robert Group. If you'd like to send questions, please SMS 41392, email stockwatch at bdtv.co.za, or tweet us on X using the hashtag Stockwatch. Uh, Derek, uh, Devin, good evening to you both. Devin, if I may start with you, you tonight. The market had a, a fairly good start to the week, um, and there were a lot of results out today. And what was interesting to me was some of the results where you would have might have expected um, a sharp decline in the share price on the back of big losses, i.e. Astral, the shares rallied. And then there were some really nice share moves in response to what looked like very decent results, i.e. Netcare. So um, w what stuck out for you today? Yes, well, I, I mean, I think uh, a lot of the explanation for that ju just shows how depressed some of the valuations have been on, on our local listed shares. And so sometimes, you know, even if it does look like bad news on face value, it's not as bad as expected. You are seeing the, the share prices move up. And, and my sense is that that could be a theme that, that perpetuates for a while. Obviously, if there's real structural governance issues, that, that might not play into it. But, I mean, if you, if you just look at, you know, those traditional SA Inc. counters, Gilletta, some of them are, are, are really priced at below basement. So, you know, the valuations give you that potential uplift if, if you have good news coming through. Mm. Um, unfortunately, maybe, maybe I'll pick a, a, a bad one to start if, if, if you want, you know, in, in terms of kind of long-term view in my perspective is Astral. Um, you know, you've got a business here that's really, really struggling to turn from, a, I think it was around a billion rand profit, now sitting at um, around 500 million loss in, in the next period. And what you've got here is a business that, that really has drivers that are almost out of its con control. You know, in, in this period, it was bird flu and, and load shedding, which, which many of the listed companies and all of us, I guess, have been struggling with. But, but you know, it could, could be anything else. It could be feed costs coming through. It could be water costs, um, you know, even, even exchange rates to, to a degree. So a really, really difficult business to get, to get a handle on. Um, and, and, yeah, unfortunately, a big hit on profitability in this reporting period. Okay, so having said that, Derek, um, Astral was up 5% basically by the close. Um, and notwithstanding the fact that, as uh, Devin has pointed out, it's, I mean, it's a company that it, you feel like it's operating with both hands tied behind its back. It's sort of tourniqueted at the knees and really has got everything coming at it. So why, um, why would you actually buy into Astral? What, what would then be the investment thesis? So I think, you know, just going back to Devin's comment around South African valuations, they are extremely low at the moment. So any sort of better than very bad news is probably going to be well received by the market at this point. I think a lot actually will probably pivot around the cost side of the businesses. As we know, we sit in this high interest rate environment. Uh, you know, any companies with a bit of debt are certainly feeling the pinch in terms of servicing those debt costs at the moment. Uh, but at that said, we're obviously sitting, in my mind, probably quite close to the top of the interest rate cycle. So once you start to see the market look through the sort of plateauing out of interest rates, those starting to come down, equities starting to come more into favor, particularly SA Inc. off these low valuations, you start to get some leverage to the upside. And then if you just focus on the cost side of, of these very much industrial type businesses, obviously so much has pivoted around uh, things like load shedding, for example. So a not very, very extremely bad situation of stage six and probably stomaching, call it a stage two scenario of load shedding or pivoting between stage two and stage three can actually have a bit of a driver on earnings in terms of where the market's pricing these stocks at the moment. So mm. it's not a runaway market. You're not going to see things uh, really uh, get excited to the upside, but certainly there's a very low base where we sit at the moment. And I think if you're patient, you can bottom pick some good quality companies that have got some leverage in a cycle that potentially turns over the next 18 months and you can make some decent money. Yeah. Okay, while we wait for questions to come in, um, what about PPC? I thought, um, I thought those results were really not bad. Um, and also you could see that the share price, I mean, actually they were pretty good. Uh, let, let me give them some credit. Uh, the share price rallied accordingly. It was up 13%. So while Astral was a big loss, PPC was actually a profit. Um, um, Devin, your thoughts on PPC? Uh, you know, it was at one stage... It was kind of a COVID stock, weirdly enough. It was like a, a post-COVID hot stock. Then it had a real wobble as I think maybe economic reality set in. 
what how would you regard it now would you would you venture anywhere near it um I'll, I'll start to the first part how would i regard it now i, I think it's it, it's definitely you know after COVID and it really got hurt badly and pre that there was this massive african expansion strategy i i, I think it's it's stuck more to its knitting now and really focusing on that southern african region and and i think they're starting to execute a lot better on that i think they've de-geared the the balance sheet massively which was a huge concern for investors for a long time so i think overall the group's looking in a much better position i i, I think also the, these results you know the the percentages in terms of growth on earnings and that look big but you you got to remember it is coming off a, a fairly low base but i think what what please the the market more than likely is that the, the direction is correct now, is that it's going up, there is growth, there's no longer, you know, selling off assets and consolidating. I, th I think they're running the, the group more efficiently, to Derek's point, I think the, the cost control has, has come through. So overall better, um, you know, where would I position it? You, you know, cement producers is still, is still quite a, a, a narrow product line to offer, um, you know, still highly competitive, you know, you know driven by um, global demand. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm not too sure that would fit in with, with me, but I think if you look at the company specifically, I think, yeah, a lot, lot better shape than it has been, and I understand mm. why the market shared the results today. Uh, Derek, would you buy it? I mean, uh, so Devin was talking about the debt situation. So at one point, it looked like it might be crushed by its debt. It's now, what, 380 million rand. So that's pretty manageable. The interesting thing was Zimbabwe, which it did really well. It's got Zimbabwe is debt free. It paid a dividend actually, um, and they talked about the money that they've got in Zim is in hard currency and is also unencumbered, which maybe have come as a surprise to people. The thing that outstands um, it remains, or they talk about remaining elusive, is South Africa. In other words, no um, infrastructure spend and no real help on import tariffs. Do you think if that had to change, that that would be like off to the races for PPC? So I think as we were chatting earlier, you know, any company with debt is always going to put a question mark in this environment. So, you know, you have to certainly salute the results that you read here with call it revenue up just under 21% and, you know, EBITDA up 46%. So actually quite a good number considering the backdrop that they've been through mm. on the back of <clears throat> a very high debt position. So I think the market was always quite concerned that, there may be a need to raise capital and that might be dilutionary to existing shareholders by way of a rights issue, for example, just to kind of get them through this very short term period of high interest rates. I see they did offload um, uh, one of their assets. I think it was a Rwanda asset, which obviously raised, I think, close to around 42 million odd dollars. So that certainly helped. Uh, and that was concluded, I think, towards the end of November. So that certainly helped. Um, or, or actually kind of, uh, you know, where we are at the moment or being concluded as I speak. So I think, you know, that's going to help, obviously, the debt position in the short term. And the market might see through the, the sort of scenario where they may not need to ra raise cash. If they can grow their numbers and grow the bottom line and obviously sit in a profitable position, they may, may be able to get out of this very precarious position. Mm. When it comes to terrorists and things like that, you know, I, I think it can only play in their favor. So, you know, what we do need to see with any construction company is economic growth. You know, we need to see some kind of investment from from the private sector as well as government starting to invest in expansionary projects. So, mm -hmm. you know, if that's the case, then you're going to see some certainly some strong leverage in a share price of, of what we're seeing in PPC at the moment. So what I buy it. I'd probably wait another six months, see how we kind of navigate uh, from an e economic perspective and then kind of make a call on the next set of numbers in a stock yeah. like PPC. Okay, what about Netcare? Um, Netcare, I mean, it came out with results which were really, really positive. Uh, and it's been maybe a while since we could say that about Netcare. Um, they had COVID, <laughs> before that they had oh, the, the, the headache of trying to kind of unravel themselves from what ended up being a very costly uh, expansion into the UK. Uh, Devon, I mean, and the share price rallied accordingly today. So um, do you think those results were off a low base or do you think actually Netcare's, you know, it's just, it's been, they're kind of getting back into their stride? 
Yeah, no, I, th I think there were strong results. You know, it was one of the greatest ironies that the hospital groups through through COVID were one of the ones that, that suffered the most. And you're starting to see that, you, you know, the end of, of the negative effect of, of that in these results. You know, you, you're starting to see more of those elective surgeries come back in. Occupancies are, are really high. And, and again, to Derek's earlier point, to the cost efficiencies, these, 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 this group is really running a lot more effectively, cut out a lot of costs in what is historically a very, you know, cost heavy base. Um, you know, to, to grow your top line by 20% in this environment, environment is just an incredible result. So yeah, um, was it 20%? Sorry, I got that wrong. Uh, Hi, maybe I'm not too sure. Sorry, ten percent. It's, and a, it's ten percent, but the headline, but the headline earnings all, uh, were up thirty-six percent. I think the adjusted headline earnings were up twenty-seven percent. So you know, tr to translate yeah, that right. kind of increase in revenue into that increase in headline earnings is pretty commendable too. Exactly. You know, it speaks to those those cost savings. There, nice increase in the dividend as well. So yeah, overall commendable set of results. I, I know there is a leadership transition in process there. It, it, it looked like, and they waiting to announce the, the new candidate. But yeah, I mean, I, mean, I, I was pleasantly surprised by these and, and I think so will share all this be. Derek, um, the thing is Netcare, so notwithstanding today's rally, is still last year, uh, well, maybe towards the end of last year, um, it hit a high of 16 Rand. So it's quite far off still its most recent highs. Do you think, what do you think, was it just the malaise that gripped a lot of the SA Inc stocks that, that dragged it lower? Do you think it's could head back um, yeah. to those levels? <laughs> I do. I actually think it looks very interesting. I think this is a very commendable result in a very tough environment. I think that just from a fundamental valuation perspective, looking at headline earnings per share increasing or adjusted HEPs increasing by 27% and a dividend underpin of 65 cents at the moment, there's certainly an argument for uh, a buy rating on a stock like this sitting you know, in the 13s at the moment. So you know, if they can continue what they're doing, the leadership uh, kind of gets uh, on track in delivering a, a consistent fundamental story over the next 18 to 24 months. I wouldn't be surprised if it actually starts to to climb higher than that 16 Rand, but it's obviously a patient wait. I think you've mm. got to uh, see it through over the next 18 months in particular, and hopefully 24 months. But it looks, it looks like there's fundamental value at current levels, and uh, I would probably lean towards being a buyer of the stock as opposed to kind of staying away from it. Okay. Before we get to some of the other um, companies that released results, a question has come through. Hooray. Um, and the viewer says, can I please have Derek's view on Berkshire Hathaway and also a company called the Markle Group, M-A-R-K-E-L. I've never heard of such a company. I don't know if it's familiar to you, but Derek, um, your thoughts on Berkshire, which has a lot of cash, um, more cash than God, in fact. So I think this is uh, the epitome of looking at putting a stock like this in the portfolio as a, in, in a high interest rate environment, as opposed to some of the companies that are laden with debt. Obviously, they're sitting on massive piles of cash. Um, and in fact, probably raising a bit of cash in the environment after some of the, the recent rallies that we've seen in things like Amazon and, you know, a lot of the tech space at the moment. So. You know, one obviously needs to be mindful of the fact that you're buying a basket of shares within that uh, Berkshire uh, stable, obviously Apple being the big signature sort of tech play within that context, as well as Coca-Cola on the other side from an industry perspective. Um, but it's a great business. You know, it's delivered year on year mm. um, with cash in hand. I think it's actually in quite a powerful position to actually um, take advantage of the environment and even look at, at other potential investments as we start to see maybe a little bit of a choppy environment in the, in the developed market. So if you don't have it, I, I mean, when do you buy it? It just keeps kind of <laughs> climbing further and further and further. Um, and the results uh, within the stable of Berkshire continue to perform. So I like the assets. If I had to hold them in there in, as individual stocks within the context of the portfolio, I would. So to answer your question, yes, mm. I like Berkshire. You hold it, but it's certainly not a short-term play. You kind of buy it for the long term and just just let them do the work that they do year on and year out. Yeah, I mean, um, we have. That, a, uh, sorry, if I can interrupt, then I'll, I'll get. I'd like to get Devin's thoughts on Berkshire as well, uh, Derek. Before sure. we go to the Markle Group. Um, I mean, we've had a chart on the screen here going back to uh, probably about 2003, 2002. 
and the performance is quite astonishing. There was a bit of a there was a bit of a wobble uh, in what is it twenty twenty one maybe um, off a peak, but it's just been relentless. Um, so, you know, Devin, you might look at it now and think, oh, I have missed this bus uh, along many stops along the way. But going back to Derek's points, do you just say, well, it has been such a good performer that it's, you know, why not buy it and, and then think of it uh, for a 20 year, 20 year view? Or do you think maybe the, the I mean, you're not going to have Charlie Munger and, and Warren Buffett in 20 years? OK, so that is the caveat. Yes, I, I mean, I think that would be the, the counter argument is, is the succession one. Um, but, you know, Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger have been at pains to stake where they buy stakes in quality businesses and allow the management of those businesses to run them. So, you know, would capital allocation change a, a bit as, you, you know, the new Berkshire leadership comes through? Yeah, it, it might. But, you know, this, this is long term patient capital and it's just worked exceedingly well. So, you know, to, to your question, would, would you buy it now? I, I think you can do a lot worse. Um, you know, Derek mentioned all the attributes you're buying a really high quality portfolio of assets. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's it's one we hold in our global funds. And I, I think what's been pleasing for, for our investors is just the consistency, you know, through market cycles, through the, the volatility we've seen of late, it's, it's really been a consistent, um, you know, ad attributed to, to the fund's performance. So we've been happy with it. On the Markle side, um, it's one of its holdings. Um, I don't know a huge amount of, about it. They have been selling it down, but it looks like a, a specialty insurer. Um, insurance has been very good for Berkshire. Um, and, and I think it's probably a valuation reason that they, they're selling down a bit there. Mm. Uh, Derek, going back to you, um, any further insight there on the Markle Group? Yeah, so I think Devin's right. I mean, I actually need to start doing a bit more homework on the Markle Group. I mean, as Devin said, it, it looked like it's uh, one of the sort of preferred insurance choice out there. Um, and obviously supporting sort of businesses like bakeries and building supplies, house plants and things like that. So quite a unique player. But to be honest with you, I need to actually spend some time looking at the fundamentals, understanding their track record before I can have a sort of concise opinion on it at this point so you've given me some homework to do <laughs> okay good um what about barla world uh that was one of the shares that came out with results today that seemed really decent uh you know in along the lines of a, a net care or a ppc but the share price didn't really do much um in reaction uh, derek um sticking with you do you think it's because barla world has actually had i think it's been a fairly strong performer um was it just maybe the market anticipated the numbers uh, and and it's fairly fully priced. Yeah, so there was actually a trading statement um, before these results. So we were guided to the number that we obviously seen at the moment. The only thing that I can kind of see as a bit of a handbrake to continued performance just looking forward is just really the soft commodity environment. And obviously, you know, with a stock like Barlow World, there's, there's quite a big component to the servicing of uh, earth moving equipment within that stable. So, you know, when, when a lot of these resource companies go into sort of watching the cost line on the back of lower commodity prices, they tend to, to hold back on a lot of uh, servicing expenditure, you know, in the short term. So I, I think the commodity environment has certainly been soft through this sort of high interest rate environment and we've seen that with these lower commodity prices and we've seen that in the share price performances if you just look at the likes of an Anglo's a bulletin and a Glencore not really catching a bit of a you know strong right. momentous sort of bid at the moment um, but that will turn you know if we do start to move into a sort of growth scenario looking forward over the next 18 to 24 months then uh, I think resources are actually quite quite well placed at the moment. It all pivots around higher resource or, or higher commodity prices. Mm. So, you know, that, there's just a bit of a dampener around resources as we sit today. But certainly, as we know, these are very cyclical. The tide can turn very quickly in a very short space of time. So, yeah. Devin, I think, uh, you know, I actually had um, the last couple of days, really, the last month of Barlow World have been a lot better. But actually, looking at that chart, it hasn't been a particularly good performer. Um, it felt like there was a time in the last 18 months when there was a bit of a rally in the Barlow World share price. Uh, so um, I've obviously not kept enough up to date with it. Um, 
do you think it's also maybe the wrong point in the cycle, in the commodity cycle, to be buying into this company? Um, I, I don't. I, I would actually say the opposite. You know, we're going through a, a point in the commodity cycle that that is quite tough. Um, prices have come down significantly. Vo volumes are lower, and and probably you're getting more more value for a company like this that you know is intrinsically linked to that commodity cycle, whether it's hard or soft commodities. I, I, I think there's an opportunity here. I think the the valuation is very undemanding. Still nice payout for shareholders. And, you, you, you know, overall, the revenue growth was respectable. I mean, to be growing at mid-teens in, in this environment where maybe not everything is going your way, I, I, I think is more than acceptable. Managed to grow profits above that. And the, the yellow metal division, you know, they supply Caterpillar, has it was the standout performance. There, there were um, the food procurement division was, was a, a soft point in, in the results. But I think I would summarize the results overall as, as very respectable and an opportunity for investors to, to look at when we do get that commodity cycle turn, okay. they'll then be well positioned. Okay. Uh, and then um, speaking of commodities, the question's just come through asking about gold. It wants the panel's view. Gold miners or gold ETFs like GLD? Uh, and what percentage of one's portfolio? Derek. So I've never been a big fan of gold stocks in particular, but, you know, I guess there's always... Uh, you know, a broken clock tells the right time twice a day. So, um, I would say I would say my preferred uh, entry point into the gold space would would be through ETFs. However, we've obviously seen an extremely strong dollar over the last eighteen months, and that could uh, kind of counteract the kind of the, the rand price, the rand gold price. If you do get a rand based ETF. Um, you know, and, and obviously the performance thereof. So you need to bank on some really strong performance in the gold price to really deliver some decent returns. You know, I'd like to see the gold price move through $2,000 convincingly and kind of uh, get a bit of a, get of a bit of a bid towards 2122. But hovering around these levels, uh, I'm not that excited about okay. it, to be honest. If we do start to move into a risk on environment, I prefer looking at some underlying equities with some better fundamental underpin, to be honest. Devin, uh, what's your thought, or your view? Look, I, I think the gold mining companies are notoriously difficult to time. I mean, you've got the, the, the gearing on that underlying gold price, which, which can be volatile as well. And when you get them right, you look very, very clever. And when you get them wrong, <laughs> you don't. So yeah, we, we, we tend to avoid the single commodity producers and particularly the, the gold miners. It's just you know, it doesn't really pay to buy, buy and hold them. On the gold price, it's, it's been interesting. I, I think a, a, a lot of managers are holding an allocation to gold. How much, I, I think, would be very personal preference. But, yeah, probably small kind of single percentages as a inflation slash currency hedge slash portfolio insurance. But what we are seeing is, is increasing the um, managers looking for the opportunity for alternatives to gold. And I think the advent or the you, you know the coming of the bitcoin etf could provide a similar proxy for some managers to hold a hedge against um monetary largesse or inflation or, or whatever it is and i think derek's point about the dollar is spot on if, if you do see the dollar continue to roll over and weaken i i think um gold plays and possibly a, a bitcoin etf play could come to the fore okay very quickly then your stock picks this evening derek what are you going for Okay, so tonight I'm going to go for Visa. Um, it's actually had a bit of a decent run through the course of this month, uh, but it has been one of those solid performers. If uh, a stock like this is kind of uh, positioned very close to call it all time highs, uh, you know, in a very tough economic environment, I think that you could, you're definitely probably going to see some further new highs made in a stock like this. It's a good quality business. Um, you know, fundamentally, it's not on a demanding valuation. Uh, looking forward, I think there's probably going to be some leverage to, to earnings as we get a better interest rate environment and consumer spend starts to pick up. So it's really just calling this top of the interest rate cycle, consumer spending potentially picking up in a, in a more friendly economic environment. So tonight, stock pick is Visa. Yeah, and that's another hell of a consistent one to have had in one's portfolio. Um, Devin, how about you? Yeah, this, this is one um, viewers of the show will, will know is one of my favorites. It's the iShare 20-year Treasury Bond ETF. 
um, admittedly been a little bit early on this one. But, you know, if, if you assume that global interest rates uh, have peaked or are in the process of peaking, um, you, you know, then, then it's likely we're going to see a significant rally in U.S. bonds. I think even if those yields continue to move a bit higher from here, I think the asymmetric payoff profile of, of getting in now is compelling. And, and I think almost regardless of if, you know, next year is a, a risk on or a risk off type environment, I, I think the total return profile of an investment like this stands investors in good stead along with an equity allocation. So, so that's one we're recommending and, and we think now is probably close to the right time. <laughs> okay, good. Timing in life is everything. Uh, Devin, Derek, thanks very much for joining us this evening. Nice to chat to you both. Uh, Derek Ganser van Rensburg is from Anchor. Uh, Devin Schut is from the Robert Group. Up next, the close. Stay with us.